The Consumer Bankers Association is pleased to welcome you to today's webinar, What to Consider for a Successful ABM Program, presented by Accurate Group. My name is Isabella, and it is my pleasure to facilitate today's event. Thank you for joining. Please note, we are recording and all participant lines are muted. If you have any trouble, please email conferences at consumerbankers.com or send a message in the Q&A box. This presentation will last up to 60 minutes and will include question and answer opportunities at the end. You may submit a question at any time by entering the questions into the Q&A box on the bottom of your screen. As a reminder, the views expressed in this webinar are those of the presenters and do not represent our speakers. Nick Heidegg, VP of Strategic Valuation Development at Accurate Group, and Frank Guanera, Director of National Sales at Accurate Group. Nick and Frank, welcome. Thank you, Isabella. So what we're going to start doing, I just wanted to give everybody just a quick, quick overview. You know, we're going to start with a couple poll questions and then really dive into the meat of what we wanted to talk about with respect to AVM selection and validation property condition report selection. We're gonna to touch a little bit on um, internal policies and procedures, as well as creating um, the evaluation and then wrap it up with uh, AVM inspection and the reconciliation review. So with that, um, Isabella, we'd like to jump right into our first poll question. So first poll question, um, do you have an ABM program or are you actively using ABMs? So interesting, so far we're at about a 60-40 split, 60% uh, using ABMs, 35-40% not using ABMs. All right, let's close out this poll and let's go on to the next poll question. So are you using an ABM cascade or a single ABM? quite a few responses in so far. Interesting, probably a 70-30 split so far, 70% using an ABM cascade and roughly 30% using a single ABM. Interesting. So let's close that question out and let's ask the final question for our poll. Um, so are you using a property condition report with the AVM? And if so, are you reconciling the two? So we've got a couple of yeses and some no's here. So we're shaking out probably a about 70% using the PCR and reconciliation, about 20% not using a PCR, and then got 7% using the PCR but not reconciling it. All right, that's interesting. So we're gonna close out the polls. And I think what we'll do is we'll kind of dive into um, what we wanted to discuss today. So Nick, if you could, maybe let's start kind of by educating us here at a high level on AVMs. And, and that's probably the best place to start. Sure, so um, I'm sure most people who are attending probably have a decent idea of how what AVMs are, but just for those who don't, an AVM is gonna be a statistically based computer algorithm that utilizes real estate data points such as property characteristics, comparables, price trends in order to produce a value. It'll use data from different sources like county auditors, uh, assessor's office, recorders, treasurers, county clerks, 
MLS data, and in even some cases, it'll use historical appraisal data. AVM Cascade is essentially a group of laterally linked AVMs that run in succession. So if you have one AVM that's the most accurate runs first, and that's not able to provide a value for whatever reason, that's when it's going to cascade to the next model in that, in that cascade. Uh, and it's going to keep doing that until either an AVM is returned or none of the AVMs are able to provide a value in which you'd see an unavailable message. Uh, AVM model scoring is really important too. Uh, there's two different types of scoring that the AVMs provide these days. Confidence score was originally built and that kind of was based, it's very different based on the modelers and it was built to quantify their essentially their confidence in the estimate of the value based on the quantity and the quality of the data they have available. Um, FSD or forecasted standard deviation came out later. Um, that one is more of an apples to apples comparison as opposed to the confidence score. With confidence score, you could have like a score of 70 and it really wouldn't mean the same thing as another modeler's AVM, completely off. Forecast is standard deviation to some extent tries to do the same, to do the uh, apples to apples comparison, but due to the underlying data, it's not always a perfect apples to apples, but it's usually a lot more easy for lenders to understand and use them with multiple AVMs in general. And then core methodologies. Uh, as I'm sure everyone's heard the term black box, a lot of what goes into the nuts and bolts of AVMs is kind of in that black box, but all of them do are based off some type of core methodologies. So more typical ones that you've heard of, repeat sales, hedonic logic, which is like appraiser emulation. But the vast majority of models these days use a blended model. So either what they'll do is they'll use different types of um, algorithms and methodologies like neural network, multiple regression analysis, fuzzy logic, and they'll blend that together to create a value. Or they might run multiple different methodologies, and then based on their internal scoring, they'll decide which one's providing the best value. So that's just kind of a little information on AVMs in general, just the basics. So, I mean, that, that helps, um, but I guess that the burning question now is, you know, how do you go about selecting either an AVM or an AVM cascade? And what should one consider um, when making that selection? Yeah, so uh, obviously you're going to go through the whole sales process, but based on interagency guidelines, there's a number of things that you really want to do and document. Um, first and foremost, we always tell lenders, go out to each of the AVM modelers, get their white papers and performance reporting. White papers is as close to the nuts and bolts as you will ever get on an AVM. And it'll explain everything about how their confidence scores work, the different methodologies, the data that's used. And then that internal performance reporting, you can use that as well. It's not usable for like a validation or internal testing, but it's just good to have an idea of how the modeler tests their AVMs and how they score them. Um, once you've kind of done that, you want to, and this, a lot of this is going to come within those white papers, but determine the underlying data used. So, you know, what type of data, data sources are using, how frequent they're updating it, do they QC the data, what do they do in non-disclosure states. Uh, next, you want to assess the model's techniques, essentially uh, strengths and weaknesses, find out if their methodology doesn't work for specific like property types. Um, maybe, maybe it's weak on condos, but it's very strong on single family homes. Once you've gone through that, you want to evaluate the AVM scoring system. So again, FSDs, confidence scores, this is what's going to give you a appropriate indicator of reliability, and it's really going to help you mitigate risk. So you want to understand each of the AVM scoring system and how they, and at least how they look at it from a high, low, and medium um, type range. Once you have that all established, you want to pu pull together some type of performance criteria. Um, that's a little bit tougher to do because when you're not understanding what metrics you want to use uh, for that performance criteria, that's when maybe using a third party will help. Or if you have an interior model risk group that can kind of look at certain accuracy and precision statistics to kind of let you know where um, the drop off is, that'll help you give an idea. So when you do the validation, and again, this is all done before you even start a validation, you're just looking for the AVMs and documenting them. But you want to do all this and get some type of performance criteria set down and established before you do that 
um, validation. And again, throughout all this process, you want to document everything you're doing with the validation on any of the models that you're actually uh, considering. So you talked a lot about validation, um, which sounds like, at least from my perspective, a pretty important piece. You know, what should lenders be doing from a validation standpoint, um, more specifically, or is there more guidance that we can offer up in terms of validation? Yeah, so validation definitely is the most important part because without that, you have no idea if the AVMs you're using are actually working well in your footprint. That, that's primarily the best way you can tell that. Um, and as I'm sure anybody who has attempted to go through a validation would know, there are a lot of moving pieces. It's very difficult and it can get really costly. Um, I could probably do a whole other webinar just on difficulties with trying to build a validation from my old days of trying to you know, do that type of work. But regarding your options for validation, there's really three. Um, some of the, most of the AVM providers will allow free AVM in-house testing. Uh, we'll see this usually with smaller lenders and credit unions. Um, but again, there are some difficulties with using that kind of data, uh, which I'll get into in a little bit. Um, the second option would be an in-house validation. Usually we'd see this with larger lenders that you know, have a model risk group that has the type of knowledge to manage a validation. And they also have the capital to be able to purchase a sample and all that good stuff that comes with it. Um, the third option, which I think is it's by far the easiest on a lender, um, and typically it ends up in the end more cost efficient as well as going with a third party validation company. Um, these can be really scaled down to the specific business. So it's not really looking at it from a large, mid-size or small credit union type size. The, the actual amount of data that you need can be customized based on your footprint. So it's a lot easier to do it that way. Um, one other thing to take into consideration is independence. Uh, the guidelines push pretty hard that you know anyone that's involved with the validation um, is independent and not part of the loan production or the collateral process. So what that really means is, and not to say any AVM modelers or providers or companies would do it, but if you have a company that's validating your AVMs and one of their own their AVMs is in that in that testing. There's always that possibility for bias. Not saying they would do it, but again, with independence being called out, it's important to make sure that you have somebody that's completely separate from any type of modeling or AVM sales function. Um, some of the core things you want to determine in a validation, uh, first and foremost, expectations for a good sample size. There, a, lot of, a lot of clients will just say, you know, I'll run 30 to 100 uh, properties against AVMs and that should give me a good sample. Unless you're a very tiny lender, that's not going to do it. So you need to understand what kind of sample size you need based on your footprint in order to get accurate results. Also need to determine what kind of geographic analysis you want to do, meaning are you going to do it at the national level? Are you going to get down to the state level? Or even more appropriately, can you do your validation down to the county level so you're really hitting um, accuracy at your core footprint? Uh, you want to know how often you're going to be testing. So every six months, once a year, every other year. Guidelines say annually, and that's what's recommended. Um, but we do see lenders that'll do it a little bit more consistently or less consistently. Uh, and then one of the big final things is standards for performance measures to be used. So I had mentioned before in the other thing, you need to define criteria for your AVMs to be able to be used. The same is going to apply to when you're building that cascade. You're looking at all these AVMs, you're testing them for accuracy and precision. You wanna have some type of performance measurement for your overall cascade as well. And then finally, costs associated with that, um, types of things you'd have to pay for if you did this all on your own, a property sample with benchmark, uh, interagency guidelines always wants to look at recent sales benchmark values. Um, and while that makes complete sense, the difficult part about that is, is it's very difficult to, to acquire and build a sample that the AVMs haven't quote unquote gamed. And what I mean by that, and I've heard this multiple times in the industry is 
you get a sample property of recent sales or you get a sample of properties that all have recent sales within, let's say, three to six months. AVMs have come along so much over the past five, 10 years that there's a good chance that a lot of those AVM modelers already have those sales injected into those AVMs. So essentially, it's like the AVMs already have the answer to the test. So it's really important when you're you know, building that sample, you're making sure that the AVMs ran don't already have the answer to the test. Another cost is going to be those AVM results. Uh, in a lot of cases with most AVM modelers, you will have to pay for those results, some cases not. Uh, and then the third, which is by far most difficult for smaller lenders is qualified personnel. Um, I can tell you from personal experience and working with different um, validation companies, there is a lot that actually goes into this. And having somebody on your staff that has the kind of um, knowledge and statistics and all that stuff in order to be able to pull one of the pull this off is kind of intense. So having that person, either you have to bring them on board or luckily you have someone on, on staff already. So those are just kind of some of the things that are important about the validation piece. So, you know, having said all that, a lot of times when I'm talking to customers that are interested in um, launching an AVM program, um, the validation seems to be the most expensive and probably the biggest hurdle. Um, are there options in the marketplace that are kind of provide an out of the box solution for lenders that might be more economical that maybe you know some folks might not have encountered already? Yeah, so there's a number of these already. And if you can hop onto the next slide, thank you. So there's a number of pre-built cascading solutions that are out there in the market. Um, what Accurate offers is our proprietary model called Compliance Track AVM Cascade. And essentially, what co Compliance Track is, is a pre built AVM Cascade solution built down to the county level that is based off of a validation. Uh, it's developed by an independent AVM validation ca and cascade design company called AVM Metrics. They are a completely independent third party. So, again, that independence pops in. They don't sell AVMs. They don't create models. All they do is testing. So they don't care what AVM is the most accurate. They just care about letting you know what AVMs are the most accurate. So we work with them and they build um, a SAT, they build uh, our cascades for us. And one of the big positives about a, a validation company like this is like I was talking about the gaming before, they're able to use their, they have a process with all the different AVM modelers they work with where when they send them the uh, recent sales, they're ensuring that those sales are not already absorbed by the AVM modelers. So when they run the AVMs, the AVMs don't have the answers to the test. A little bit more about compliance track. Um, our, even though guidelines say you really only have to do that validation or updating of your cascade annually, compliance track is updated every six months. Uh, and that just provides, obviously, a little bit better accuracy on a more consistent basis due to the validation. Uh, the AVMs are ranked, and the cascades are used using advanced analytics, proprietary analytics that, that ensures that the AVMs you're getting and the cascades built are based on accuracy, precision, and a little bit of hit rate as well. Um, they also offer a white paper document called an executive summary that will back up everything that, that's behind compliance track, the validation, AVM testing ranking, it has all the nuts and bolts in there. And we've even seen some of our um, lenders be able to use this documentation for regulators. For any regulators that might be a little bit more strict, especially like OCC, and they're gonna wanna see the actual analytics, that type of um, Excel documentation and all the analytics and stuff is available as well. So, um, oh, sorry, go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt you. I was nope, gonna, nope, nope. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I guess what I was going to ask is what, you know, from a cost perspective, what, where does that fit in? Um, using some type of pre built cascade, whether it's compliance track or some, something else in the marketplace, what's your experience then with 
the cost of doing something like that, like an out of the box solution? Yeah, so so most AVMs you're gonna get just single AVMs by themselves for around $15, $20, I would say is somewhat on average. Uh, compliance track that includes all the different AVMs. We have 12 currently in it. Uh, it includes all the AVMs that are available. It includes the white paper. It includes the six month update. And you can do that for around $20. And that's, and that's per hit. So you're not paying a bunch extra for the validation. You're not paying a bunch extra to uh, test the AVMs. You're, it's just a per hit price out of the box. So it really does make it a lot easier. So effectively, you know, a, a customer or a lender that let's just say they're running or have a need, they're, they're smaller lender or more regional, let's say they're going to run less than 500 a month. Um, it sounds like that is a much more cost effective approach than trying to do the validation themselves. I mean, is that a fair statement or? For a smaller lender, absolutely. If they want to go about a validation truly the right way, yeah. Um, yeah. It, to be, because to be able to do that, like I said, extremely expensive, it's difficult. So having something that basically just slaps you in the face and tells you, hey, this is everything that you needed is definitely a benefit. All right. So then, you know, once you have the AVM, the AVM cascade, the validation, all that stuff, you know, when we had talked before, you know, the next thing you were pretty, um, you know, adamant on is the, the property condition report. So, you know, what should users of AVMs and property condition reports, what should they consider when they're evaluating either a property condition report or a property condition report provider or both for that matter? Yeah. Yeah, so obviously, you know, as we saw in the 2010 interagency guidelines, one of the biggest things that came out there is if you're going to use an AVM or any type of tax value, um, you have to take property condition to account. Um, property condition reports, what we've seen from our group that does it, on average, 90 to 95% are coming back average, but that essentially lets you know that, you know, you can use that AVM. AVMs are always going to assume average condition. That's just how they're built. So if you have a property that's coming back in, you know, poor condition, you probably want to dump that AVM completely. Because if the outside looks that bad, you want to take a look at the inside. If the A or the condition comes at, come back in, you know, better than average condition, you could potentially use that AVM if you want, but you might be leaving a little bit of money on the table for yourself and the borrower. So it might be better to, you know, upgrade maybe to like an exterior just to see if, you know, um, that, that value is going to go up a lot more. Regarding the type of people uh, that you should hire for it, like you can kind of see in the, in the post that there are definitely quote unquote inspectors out there that do, you know, this as kind of like a side job. Um, we don't believe you should hire those type of inspectors. Uh, they really should be a real estate professional in some manner, whether that's an agent, a broker, appraiser, or even a home inspector, just somebody that understands what they should be looking for. They should have some type of local market knowledge regarding that area. Um, they should be background checked, and they should definitely, to some extent, be trained on what the product is that they're doing an inspection for. So... All that being said, what should a property condition report contain? Like, is there a list of things that that condition report should contain? Well, there's not specific regulation right around inspection reports. However, there definitely are some things that it needs to include. Obviously, the location of the property. You want to have photos of the property exterior. Uh, you want to have the overall property condition. Um, in some type of form, whether that be, you know, based on uh, the typical standard format or something that at least lets you know if it's an average above or below. Uh, you also want to know what the property's designation or land use is. You want to have in there some type of description of the neighborhood or, or like local market conditions, because that'll give a good idea of whether, you know, when you're looking at the AVM, if local marketing conditions are just skyrocketing, 
maybe that AVM is going to be a little bit behind on that. Um, they, there should also be some type of commentary if there are any type of negative influences found, whether that be with the, uh, the property itself or in the pictures, just something to provide some type of commentary and any repairs that are there. Uh, and then finally, you definitely want to have somebody, whoever is finishing up these property reports, doing some type of QC work on it to, to at least make sure everything is complete. All the prop, all the pictures are are uh, appropriate. They're there, and everything's uh, complete and valid. Well, that that's helpful. Um, again, you know, when you and I were talking prior to this webinar, you know, you you kept going back to policies and procedures and kind of really hammering that point um, home. Is there any, I guess, I want to say guidance, but maybe um, uh, maybe something you could elaborate for the group in terms of policies and procedures, what those should look like or contain? Yeah, so, so one thing I'll, I, I will definitely say about policies and procedures, um, when it comes to AVMs and inspections and the interagency guidelines as written, I always like to kind of say they were written in gray ink, just because they're, they're so open to interpretation. And one thing we've noticed is that lenders and regulators don't even always see eye to eye on the spirit of regulations. And while they might be open to interpretation, you could always be told by a regulator, you know, maybe you need to do this or maybe you need to do that. But the one thing they'll never argue about is if you're at least following your own policies and procedures. So whatever you do put in there, make sure you follow it because it's when you don't follow that and you go off the script and you say, hey, maybe I'll just use this AVM even if it's not inside our, it doesn't meet our criteria and they find it, that's when you can get in trouble with AVMs. So it, just a little bit more uh, detail on that policies and procedures. Um, not all property types are gonna be good for an a, for to use for an evaluation, I should say. So complex properties, a, AVMs, they're really good at cookie cutters and they definitely hit complex properties and rural properties. But once you start getting into ones that are like a waterfront and maybe it's one of three on that lake, that's a very complex property. AVMs aren't gonna be suited for that. If it's large acreage, maybe it's farmland, something like that, not suited for AVMs. And then obviously any transaction with like a lot, with like a high loan to value, those are ones you're going to want to avoid either. Um, another, another thing to keep in mind is the property types. AVMs were essentially designed and work well for single family residences, condos, townhomes, row homes, and PUDs. Now, there are AVMs out there that can do mobile, manufactured, multifamily, vacant lands, a lot of different kinds. I never recommend those if you're actually lending on it. If you just want an idea of what the value is, sure, give it a whirl. But there's very, very, very little testing out there that was done on those type of properties. And just in my experience, they're not very reliable. Not so much the, the value. The hit rates are always off a lot. Um, it, it, they just don't work well in lending situations. If possible, stick to the cookie cutters. That's when you're going to get the best bang for your buck out of AVMs. Um, another thing to mention, which is really important, and I said this before, I believe, but make sure someone outside the loan production uh, process is doing a reasonable check on that original AVM when they get it. Uh, because of the black box nature, it's very difficult to review an AVM. Um, like you would review a standard appraisal or a hybrid type product, but you at least need to do some type of reasonable check or sanity check on the original AVM and the value. Make sure the data is there. And I'll get into that a little bit more as well later. Um, when it comes from a quality assurance standpoint, um, it, it's, important to, it, it's important to look at your cascade and make sure everything's working the way it should. So you want to make sure that the AVM that you're actually receiving when you order a cascade is the same AVM that was validated and designed to be in that cascade. Uh, another thing to keep in mind, create an upgrade process. So when AVMs are not a good fit for your area. So situations of that could be, you need a certain number of verifiable comps or sales that, that kind of match that property. Uh, if, there, if you didn't get this already during the application and you have upgrades or new finished completed repairs that were done. 
that's something that you should probably take into consideration and maybe not use an AVM on. And one other thing we always say, while you can't actually use like a customer estimated value in the creation of an AVM, there's nothing that says you can't use that for a sanity check on an AVM. So what we'll see some lenders do is they'll kind of do like a plus or minus 10% um, error percentage between the AVM value and the customer's estimated value, just to kind of get an idea that it makes sense. Uh, one thing a colleague of mine did um, when he was at a large bank is he did a study on uh, customer estimate of value and how that actually applied to value. And surprisingly, and this was extremely surprising to me, borrowers are, tend to be pretty close. And I think that has to do with all the different AVM technology available through like Zillow and, and all those different types of models out there that are available to consumers online. Uh, and then the last thing I did want to mention was setting up an oversight committee. Uh, uh, just to have somebody that can do ongoing monitoring of the program, just to make sure, you know, nothing's going off the rails. So a couple of things you could kind of look at, hit rates. Make sure that, you know, hit rates are always going to fluctuate a little bit. We definitely see hit rates um, dive down a little bit more in the spring. Um, so they're going to they're gonna vary a little bit. But if you see like a 10%, 5 to 10% or more uh, swing from one month to another, that's an indicator that something might be wrong and you want to check out your cascade. Also, again, do quality assurance, or not again, but quality assurance reviews. Um, those are always something you can do if you have a negative trend in quality. Maybe you're noticing that, you know, AVM after AVM, you're not getting, you're, they're not usable for whatever reason. Document all that. Document that, and then you can go back at some point and say, hey, we documented all the AVMs we didn't use. We noticed AVM1 is we're failing it all the time. It's, it must just have bad accuracy. That's something to look at as well. So Nick, before we finish up the policy and procedures section here, we did get one question. Um, and the question is about, you know, what about using an AVM for a single family home being used as an investment property? Um, what, what is your um, experience in that realm? I mean, is that a good use case for AVMs? Well, I, I honestly, I haven't heard that question before. However, just looking at it from a logical standpoint, AVMs don't care what the property is being used for. They just care that it's a single family home. So that's what they're going to estimate value on is that single family home. Now, whether you should be using an AVM, um, AVM inspection reconciliation product for an investment property, that might be a different story, but the AVM shouldn't have any issues with estimating value on a single family. So it's probably a, um, a credit risk question, but yeah. the AVM, if I hear you right, the AVM is probably going to run as accurately as it would if it was just a thing. It wasn't a, a, an investment property, but more so you take that question and lay it up against credit risk policy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah definitely. That It's an internal business decision. You got to make sure. sure of that. Okay, perfect. Um, and so wrapping this up, how do lenders ensure that they really have everything they need from a policy and procedure perspective to kind of wrap things up? Yeah, sure. So again, I'll just mention this one more time because it is, while it's surprisingly easy, it's very easy to miss. Obtain each of the AVM's white papers and performance reporting. That's a big one. Um, also, another thing to put in there, just educate your internal users um, most, any provider of AVM should be able to do some type of review with your team just to give them the kind of frequently asked questions. There, it, over my 15 plus years of using AVMs and working with lenders, there is probably 10 questions that I still get constantly. And those are just the type of questions that you know, random loan officers aren't going to know the answers to. So make sure they understand they're getting an AVM. It is a black box to some degree. It's not always going to be super accurate. You can't dispute AVMs because they're sold as is. So understand that this is a product that really should be used um, sparingly. 
It's obviously a good product to save money and where it works, it's very effective. It's just that you want to make sure that they're not just using it because, you know, that product's there, it's fast and it's cheap. Sure. Um, also, one other thing that I have, you could scroll one more up, please. Thank you. Sorry. So um, under here, you should see policies and procedures. Make sure the, these are the different guidelines that are going to apply um, to AVMs, validation testing, and evaluations. Make sure that you have this documentate or this documented within your AVM program documents. Um, that, that's going to be pretty Im imperative just to know that you, so if you do have a regular account in, they know, um, you know, you went through those guidelines and this is what you're trying to uh, abide by. And then that next slide, I'll just hit real quick. Sure. This one? And, yeah. And this was just a, a sample credit matrix. These are completely just made up, but any lender can create these. And they're probably not very different than what most lenders would create in their policies and procedures for, say, standard appraisals, hybrids, or anything like that. Um, but you definitely want to have one and know when and when not to use AVMs. So you want to base it off things like, again, LTV, the transaction amount. You want to make sure you stay under that 400000 minimus. Uh, Property value ranges, you want to have a max and a minimum that you don't want to go above or below. Credit scores or credit tiers will obviously play some role in that. And then again, like I mentioned, property type. You want to specifically put what type of property types that you will allow AVMs on. That's helpful, Nick. <clears throat> so we got about 20 minutes left. And what I wanted to make sure we hit are two more topics with regard to you know, evaluations, yeah, specifically. So I guess the million dollar question is, is an AVM and a PCR an evaluation? Does that constitute an evaluation? If not, then what is an evaluation? Yeah. So no, it does not. Uh, just putting an AVM in a property condition report would be considered a reconciliation. Uh, there's definitely more that's included in order to actually build an evaluation. So if you're jumping on the next slide, please. Sure. So we always look at it as a two-step process of ordering the AVM, making sure that that AVM first and foremost works for your loan. That's when you kind of want to do your sanity check on the value, review the AVM, make sure it makes sense. Then you order the inspection. Uh, there are some products out there that will kind of do a combined, but if you can't use the AVM, you just waste the inspection cost. So don't order that inspection until you know you got your AVM. Um, critical success factors when you're creating an evaluation, independent reviews, reviewers. Make sure they're not the same people doing the loan process. They should be independent. Uh, you want to stay, again, compliant with all, your re with all the regulations that I kind of mentioned, as well as your internal policies. Um, you also want to have at least documented for your evaluation sufficient information analysis to support, to support that decision. So again, that's kind of looking at additional comparables and that kind of stuff. Also, take a risk-based approach to determine the depth of the review needed. If you have a much larger loan, maybe spend a little bit more time looking at that AVM, pulling some more comps. And then do some type of internal audits on the people that do your evaluations that are actually you know, signing off and completing them. You want to make sure that, again, just like I said before, they're not letting everything go through or they're not just, you know, um, canceling every order. And then so, um, just, oh, sorry, go, oh, ahead. go ahead, sorry. No, go ahead. I was going to say, as far as creating the actual evaluation, uh, different items you should definitely include, location of the property, description of its current and projected use, um, estimate of property's market value as well as its physical condition. Um, and then when we're looking at the different sources of information in the analysis, uh, you can use external data sources. You want to have property specific data. You want to have evidence of the property inspection. And you definitely need to have some type of description of the neighborhood or local market conditions. And that's got to be built into the actual evaluation. So most of this that you have on the screen, at least from my recollection, is all in the interagency guidelines. Is that a fair statement? 
Pretty much. Yeah, it all comes from it. Okay. So the, the final question is then how do you turn all of this into an evaluation then? Like what is the, uh, how does, how does it become an evaluation? So it, you have your AVM, you have your inspection, you do the review on it. What actually turns it from a reconciliation into an evaluation is when somebody literally signs off on that evaluation. They've, they've verified that, that val or they've signed off on the, the value and they've signed off on the overall valuation. That's what creates it. So when you're review, oh, go ahead, sorry. No, no, go ahead, I'm sorry. I was just gonna say, you know, when you're doing the AVM review, and I might butcher this a little bit, but one of the greatest things I've ever heard when it comes to AVMs, and this might sound a little counterproductive to some, but the best thing an AVM can really tell you is when not to use it. Like I had said, AVMs have a lot of value, but I think when lenders start using them and, and kind of leaning them as on a crutch, and not actually doing the due diligence of reviewing those AVMs and making sure everything makes sense from a sanity standpoint, that's when you get in trouble. And AVMs are really good at telling you when not to use them. Um, some of the kind of criteria you can look for, for absolute sure, and this might sound like a no brainer, but make sure the AVMs address matches the property type. Um, while it doesn't have it happen all, a lot, you know, we'll see this more with condos that have unit numbers, apartment numbers. Sometimes if the AVM is not put in pr properly or the right way the county has it, you could spit out a different address. And we see this a ton of times when you have like multifamily homes. Um, so make absolute sure that the address that's on that AVM is matching that. Um, obviously, you don't want to use any AVM value that's 30 days prior to the date you're using it. Um, you want to check at least five, at least five highly similar comparables that have sold or pending to be sold within the next 30, 365 days. You can go out and use different online sources if you want. Zillow, Realtor.com, Redfin, Trulia. They'll have that type of doc information available for free that you can use as kind of a secondary source. Um, other things that kind of get you the same criteria, if there's a lack of core property characteristic data, that to me is usually a good sign that maybe the AVM wasn't using all the data that it should have to estimate value. Now, I know there are different AVM methodologies that don't require a lot of that information, but for me, I always feel that, you know, GLA, bed, bath, lot size, previous sale price and date, that kind of information needs to be there in order for me to feel that the AVM has a very good look at that property. Um, then other things that I've mentioned before, uh, you can use that owner's estimate of value. That's another way you can, you know, throw that as a review tool. Um, obviously you're going to have your FSD and confidence scores. You're going to want to make those predetermined. Now, now, some, some cascades like compliance track can manage those FSD and confidence scores for you. So you don't have to like, look at the AVM, say it doesn't meet it, fail it. The technology will say, run the AVM, doesn't make that confidence score, move to the next. And it does that automatically for you. But you need to make sure that you're looking at those one way or another. So I've heard that all of these items that you just mentioned, the AVM, the PCR, the evaluation, all, I'm sorry, the review needs to be combined into a single document to be considered an evaluation. Is that a true statement? Is it not a true statement? What's the, what, what's your experience on kind of what constitutes an evaluation? Yeah, so, so for the most part, that, that's correct. But as I kind of said before, that it's that final review of the value and the sign off that really creates the evaluation or an analyst that does, whoever's, whoever's actually preparing and finishing that document, that's what puts it. So, um, you know, Accurate Group, we have a, uh, a report called Eval Works that can combine any AVM type of solution you want, whether it be compliance track, one AVM, a competitor's pre-built solution, whatever the case may be. You can combine that with our Groundworks property inspection, and then we create what you see there, which is a summary page. And that gives kind of all the highlights that come out of those interagency guidelines, things that you need to take into consideration. 
So the reconciliation report that we provide is essentially something that's assisting lenders in adhering to evaluation guidelines if they want to build a, uh, an evaluation product using an AVM and an inspection. Um, and then one other thing to kind of mention it that, you know, just based on the reconciliation, it is considered an evaluation based on federal guidelines, but always look into your own personal state guidelines just to see if they have any um, specific provisions about who can and who can't sign off on the evaluation. That kind of, that totally varies by state, but just worth noting as kind of like a cap on the end of it. Perfect. Well, Nick, I appreciate that. I've got one additional question that um, we can uh, throw up here. Question is, on average, and I don't know if you have any data on this, but on average, how do AVM values compare to full appraisals or even desktop appraisals? Do you have any, any data on that? You know, we haven't. Um... I've always wanted to do it on full appraisal, but there's just some, you know, obviously is, obvious issues with that. But basing it off like a value in a 55 would definitely be a good um, test just to see. Um, again, we, we do a lot of our testing just because it's so difficult to build those samples. All of our testing goes through AVM metrics. Got it. So they kind of do their precision testing based on recent sales. Okay. So that's how we look at it. But that sounds like a good idea for the future. So I got a, one more question. I think we still have en enough time if anybody has additional questions. But there's another question around um, how does someone kind of determine FSD or confidence score thresholds? Like, I guess, you know, how do, how do you figure out what you want to use when you're talking about those, those cutoffs? Yeah, so so that's probably one of the toughest parts that you know lenders have problems with, and this goes right back to what I mentioned about confidence scores and FSD scores, AVMs not being you know exactly on the same playing field. Um, so when someone wants to determine an FSD or confidence score threshold, it's the F. You could go with an FSD or a confidence score and say, like FSDs, the lower, the better. You could do something and say, you know, you could set your own threshold across the board and say 15 and 25, and you're still going to be mitigating a good amount of risk by using a threshold like that across the board. However, you're going to have some AVMs with good values that you're kicking out, and you're going to have some AVMs where you have bad values that you're letting go through. So what we see as best practice is actual, through the validation testing, test those AVMs against their confidence score. Um, there's different statistics you can use for it, but essentially you just want to see at what point does your, when you're going down confidence scores or FSD scores, at what point does your accuracy just drop? And that's when you know the AVM starting to fail at a certain threshold. Now, just like AVM validation, that kind of stuff can change too. So when you're validating FSD scores and determining those for your cascade, that's something you're going to want to do at least annually as well. That's helpful. I appreciate it. Um, Isabel, I don't see any additional questions coming through. Um, I know we're running up against the end of the hour here. Um. Yeah, I don't see any other questions here in the chat box. Um, unless someone has anything to send over. Do you guys want to provide possibly an email or a way for people to contact you if they do have further sure. questions? Yeah, um, I'm wondering why it's not displaying, but I could, let me put this side up really quick. And the last, there it is, it just wouldn't show. So we've got contact information, email. Um, if anybody has questions that they didn't want to put into the chat and you wanted to reach out to either of us, um, we'd be happy to answer those questions for you, you know, separate and apart from the, uh, the webinar today. Hey. 
that looks like it's it. So we'll wrap up. Um, thank you everyone for joining us today. And with that, we will conclude today's program. This session has been recorded and will be available within three to five business days on our website. On behalf of the Consumer Bankers Association, thank you to our speakers. And of course, all of today's participants have a great afternoon and you may now disconnect. Okay.